Um, <clears throat> look, I was in um, in New York about six weeks ago, and I um, I went out and specially uh, looked at some of those tall pencil type uh, buildings that are going up, and um, and it, it is really really difficult to get an idea of the scale of them. I mean, it's um, they are just really tall, and when you're standing there, you hope that they um, they had a decent wind consultant, and um, we've certainly got someone here who knows a lot about that. Leighton Cochran um, is um, <coughs> part of Mel Consultants, who are, who are, I think the premier wind consultants in um, in Australia. Some people would um, possibly dispute that, but uh, Bill Melbourne, the the, uh, the founder, was an old lecturer of mine, so uh, I'm, I'm batting for him. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, Leighton, uh, come and tell us about uh, wind on tall building, mate. Thank you very much. Found a pointer. Okay. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, uh, what I'd like to do is have a look at some of the aspects of uh, tall building design that pertain to wind, and um, I'll swing that around a bit. Uh, most of this comes from an ASCE webinar series I would give for um, uh, uh, one of the co-organisers of, of this organisation when I was in the United States, so um, it's probably quite appropriate. Uh, just to, because of the educational nature of, of what we're talking about here, um, I've um, got a real need to give some credit to various people, you know, so um, I've taken images from a variety of universities that are famous in wind engineering, including a couple in Australia, University of uh, New South Wales and Monash, and uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology in Asia, um, and then the last three or four groups, uh, there's some images and videos that have been generated by people in those companies as well, so I give thanks to that. In Australia, we have uh, um, a standard um, that allows us to do wind calculations. Uh, it's typically reasonably conservative, um, and there are sort of two components to it in a most general sense. One is that uh, the analytical approach of just doing the um, calculations um, and that is quite satisfactory for buildings that are rectilinear, typically, and less than, say, 200 metres. In fact, the code specifically says if it's more than 200 metres, you've got to have a look at it in the wind tunnel. There's benefits of having a look at, it, at projects in the wind tunnel at a lower elevation than that. Uh, probably one thing worth mentioning here is that uh, the if you do a wind tunnel test, um, it supersedes the standard or the code and you can't pick and choose. So if you've done a wind tunnel test and you've got some results and you don't like them, you've really got to stick with the, um, with, with what the physical wind tunnel test tells you because it's a site-specific, building-specific examination of your building's geometry, and whereas the code is actually made from literally hundreds of wind tunnel tests and it's been condensed into a, into a form that's uh, uh, more analytical and easy to use, relatively speaking. Okay. Wind, in a, in a very gener general sense, uh, all our winds are generated from um, the, uh, uh, s the impact of uh, the sun differentially heating the Earth's surface at various locations, and you get these Hadley cells um, around the Earth. And then the other parameter I just wanted to touch on is that the wind that is generated in, in some form or other is influenced by the motion of the Earth in the Coriolis sense, and so you get a turning of the wind depending on when, you, when the wind is trying to go from a high pressure area to a low pressure area. So that's a very generic origin of where wind comes from. Uh, this uh, little sculpture, as you might recognise if you've been up to Darwin, it's uh, some poles left over from um, Cyclone Tracy that made a sculpture of. It gives you an idea of the strength of the wind when it's not accounted for. Meteorologically speaking, uh, you can divide it into a variety of different... Uh, types of wind, you've got extratropical depressions or gales, those tend to be mid-latitude sorts of events. People in uh, Melbourne and Sydney would probably feel more comfortable with those. There's tropical cyclones, which tend to be from the equator down to uh, 
about, uh, from about 5 degrees to about 40 degrees. They affect cities and buildings um, near the ocean. They diminish as, a, as they move over the coast. I'll talk a little bit about those. Thunderstorms are a lot more localised. They're not synoptic scales. They're more like medium level events, meso mesoscale events. We get them in Brisbane a lot. I'll talk briefly about that. The last one there is a type of wind called downslope wind that um, is typically not an issue in Australia because we don't have any substantial mountains. But if you lived in New Zealand or you're designing in New Zealand, you need to be aware of this, that they're, they're thermally driven and... Uh, and basically the air, as it reduces in elevation, heats up. They're always associated with warm winds, high-speed warm winds. Okay, cyclones, hurricanes, typhoons, um, all effectively the same phenomena in different parts of the world. They exist between those two latitudes, typically uh, five degrees off the equator and 40 in that range, but they tend to be stronger within a 10 to 30 degree range. Um, if there's no wind shear, that is, as if the wind is... As you move up in elevation, there's no shear, horizontal shear of the wind. They'll tend to survive and grow. They need more than 26 degrees C uh, uh, water temperature, so in the cooler areas they'll disappear. They're a complex three-dimensional vortex, basically, and uh, this image actually is one I took off the GOES satellite. Um, it's uh, Hurricane Andrew arriving at Miami in 1992, but it's a thermal image, so you can see the rising warm and the sinking cooler parts of the vortex in the hurricane as it's moving onto the coast. This is actually from the insurance industry, but I thought it was quite interesting. It actually shows all sorts of natural disasters, but let's for the moment focus on the uh, green tracks being hurricanes, cyclones, typhoons. Two things come out of this I just wanted to point out to people. Um, you can see where we are and the, the tracks that we're all familiar with around the world. Interestingly, nothing happening around South America or in this part of Africa. And the reason for that is there's cold ocean currents from the Antarctic that go up through there, just don't get cyclones and hurricanes there. Um, the other thing that leapt out at me when I first saw this is a band of hurricane-free tracks along the equator. The reason for that is that the equator, by definition, Coriolis force is zero, so you can't get any rotational activity creating the cyclone or the hurricane in the first place. So that gives you this band in the 30 to, in the 10 to 30 degree range where most of them tend to exist. And we're living there at the moment. Thunderstorms. These affect uh, Brisbane quite a lot. And unlike hurricanes where if you're a designer in a hurricane or cyclonic environment, um, you can be reasonably confident that the building operators will have adequate knowledge of the arrival of a cyclone. Um, because there's your two or three days warning. Uh, in the case of a, uh, in the case of a uh, uh, thunderstorm, that's not necessarily the case, and I'll give you an example of that in a minute. In fact, this is a specific uh, case almost exactly two years ago. It was the 27th of November 2014. We had a substantial uh, uh, um, thunderstorm with a decent downburst, and this happens to be Archer Field Airport. There's an anemometer there. I went into the Met Bureau and got the record for the day. And the reason I point this out is that you may not be able to read that, but it's about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and, and that's 4.22. So from 4.22 to 4.30, eight minutes, it ramped up from about 40 kilometres an hour to 141 kilometres an hour at this particular locale. While it was doing it, the temperature dropped 15 degrees, which is the mechanism of a, of a downburst. Um, in fact, if I go back, you can see here the uh, rising, rising warm air, and it gets to the point where the evaporation and the, and the rain happening, that you end up with this dumping down of cool air. It hits the ground, spreads out. It would still be like a giant donut rushing out. In reality, they're travelling slightly. And uh, that's uh, what is a design feature. Uh, that we need to take care of because and I'll talk a bit about this uh, um, in a minute um, with regards to the impact it has on tall buildings and particularly tall residential buildings. Tornadoes, when I was a grad student over in the US I was actually uh, lucky enough to be able to go on some of the uh, tornado tracing, chasing teams with the, um, the university in Kansas and, and parts of eastern Colorado. But anyway, uh, these things are a lot of fun to chase. They're pretty dangerous. We don't get a lot of them in Australia. They tend more to be a North American 
thing. We do get them occasionally, but they're not as prevalent as in the US. So we typically don't design for them in this country. Uh, they are very localised, unlike all the other mechanisms we've been talking about. That's just a track there, a few hundred metres wide. These houses are perfectly fine, apart from having a bit of junk thrown on them from these houses. Uh, High-rise buildings, pretty rare for them to be hit. This one here um, is lost all its cladding. It's almost a sacrificial method of saving the structure in a way because the building was fine, just had to reclad it. However, um, there's not very many cases of this happening. The first one of real consequence was in, uh, that I'm aware of anyway, was in Lubbock in Texas in 1974. And there's a, uh, an insurance building in Lubbock that's about uh, 20 storeys and it was hit and it actually twisted the steel frame of the building permanently. And if you go to Lubbock and you stand on the footpath, you can look up and you can see about a 300 millimetre twist in the shape of the building. It's a, from an engineering point of view, it's quite interesting. But all they did was put some more cladding on it and then realign the elevator lines because they were all twisted up and the way it went, problem solved. So with the exception of tornadoes, everything I've mentioned previously can be in investigated reasonably well by a code calculation that assumes a boundary layer flow over the ground or a wind tunnel study which models that boundary layer flow over... Um, over the surrounding suburbia and, and so forth. So um, this uh, is I've, I've, this is actually the American system has exposure A, B, C, D. We have terrain categories one, two, three. Very similar though. There's more of an open country environment, uh, more of a suburbia environment. And um, what 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 I wanted to point out with these, both the code or in the wind tunnel. These are just mean profiles of wind speed. They are somewhat more uniform in the smooth area. This boundary layer profile is the mean wind speed that's generated and it's constrained by friction on the ground. And so there's this region where the influence of friction on the ground is affecting wind flow. Beyond that height on those four cases, nominally the wind is constant with height. But if you're in building in a city, and you've got a three or 400 metre building, you're entirely within that boundary layer. Superimposed upon this mean boundary layer, which has more curvature for the rougher environment and less curvature for the um, more um, open environment, is this sketch here of fluctuating wind. So it's a gustiness of the wind, there's fluctuation, but on average, it looks like that. And that's what you're seeing in the, in the AS1170 when you're doing your train category calculations. We model this in a wind tunnel, sort of give you show you a couple of examples. There's two print, they're big, big, big boxes with a large fan in them and roughness elements, and I'll just describe those a little bit. These, these, these are two basic forms. Here's one here, it's called a recirculating wind tunnel. It can be horizontal or vertical in its uh, arrangement. That's quite common. And there's open circuit wind tunnels, and both have advantages and disadvantages. The open circuit one has the advantage that the Air, the air is not being heated by the fan, but it's also dirtier because you're bringing in new air all the time, whereas this one here, your instrumentation does better. So there's a few technical reasons people do, do different designs, but uh, that's the essence of it. Here's an example of one, and it's uh, basically all the wind tunnels will have something similar to this in that you've got a turntable to allow you to look at different wind directions. I chose this one because you probably recognise the city. It's the Gold Coast, Service Paradise. And in the background here, the wind is coming from the far end, goes over some spires and a two-dimensional trip and a whole lot of roughness elements, usually 15 or 20 metres of roughness elements. And the purpose of all of that is to get the right profile of the mean flow, to get the right turbulence profile that I mentioned before. And also another parameter, which I'll discuss a bit later, is the, uh, the, um, uh, the correct uh, energy con content of the turbulence is a function of eddy size and it comes into play a little bit with tall buildings. So people would do wind tunnel testing for a variety of reasons. I've put down some here. Unusual structures and that's something we're seeing a lot more of thanks to architects being more imaginative and engineers like Richard being able to analyse what they come up with. Um, or if it's over 200 metres, um, there's a lot of shielding or channelling. They're almost sort of like two sides of the same coin. You can protect the building with its neighbours or your neighbours can actually amplify the local environment and the wind tunnel test to tell you that. Terrain might be an issue. There's not very many big cities where terrain's a huge issue. Hong Kong's the most obvious one. Um, and uh, parts of uh, Rio as well. 
Uh, for more accurate results, because the code is a generic, somewhat conservative document, AS um, 1170, and or to save money, and you know, that's what um, developers and builders and all sorts of people like to hear. I don't tend to emphasise it, because very rarely you will sometimes come up with a problem in the wind tunnel that's actually more expensive that you wouldn't have known about. The engineer's happy to know about it because he's now his, uh, his insurance policy is now safer, but um, most of the time you do save money with a wind tunnel test, which is the thrust of uh, motivation for many people. Uh, unusual structures, clearly they're not code buildings. This is a modest little four and a half thousand square metre home in California on a hill. There's the finished product, couldn't do that with a code calculation and obviously that's not very, prism not very um, uh, rectilinear, which is basically the codes are mostly based around rectilinear shapes. But let's get to the topic of the tall buildings, which I think is the interesting one. Here's some, some in Brisbane that you're probably all familiar with, and maybe not all of them. But uh, obviously we've talked a bit about the uh, Meriton building up in Ann Street there, uh, the uh, Sahil one. Um, then we've got... Uh, um, so its unique feature probably was it has a tuned liquid column damper. It's the only one in Brisbane, and it's one of two in southeast Queensland. So it's relatively uncommon. Um, we've got uh, Sky Tower here, which is just a, a very tall building by Brisbane standards. Uh, we have uh, the 545 Queen Street proposal, which is nominally a triangular sort of shape, which for a wind engineer and a structural engineer is usually a red flag from a dynamics point of view and from a vortex shedding perspective and being able to get your centre of stiffness and centre of mass in the same place and a whole lot of things can be difficult with triangular buildings. So that done a, bit, a lot of work on that one. And the one in the middle here is right next door. So there's us in the in the um, in the uh, customs house. Uh, this is uh, 433 Queen Street, uh, 443 Queen Street, um, and it's it's uh, going to it's hard to tell from this because it's sort of see through pressure model. But I'll show you some other sketches later. That it's actually made up of two. Um, wings, so to speak, they require a little bit of special work. So we have some unusual buildings here in Brisbane. Three topics I'm touching on with regards to wind engineering, and they are, just checking the time there, they are um, cladding pressures, structural loads, and, and perhaps some pedestrian stuff at the end. Mechanisms that cause cladding issues with buildings are typically separation, where the wind can't stay attached and you get strong negative pressures here, or it could be on a roof as well. Um, corner vortices on a roof, so you get high negative pressures underneath these that tend to try and lift the roof off. And when you get a break in the, in the continuity of a tall building, so you have a, a podium at the base of your tall building, there is a chance that you'll end up with quite high pressures here. This one, the wind's coming in here, you can see the smoke giving a separated flow there, buried within is a little tiny vortex like a baby tornado coming up from this podium area. The pressures on that bit of the facade were substantially more than up on the roof. Um, so it's, it's, sometimes it's counterintuitive. So those are the mechanisms. This is uh, how one measures it. You build a model and you put hundreds of pressure taps in, lots of tubes, and uh, you put more of them where the action's going to be in the corner, and you have few of them on the broad face of the building because the rate of change of pressure across there doesn't change very much. It's the edge strips and the corners where you put a lot of the pressure taps. The data comes out with the external pressures and then you have to add in the internal pressures. And uh, this is just a generic discussion of internal pressures and I'll concentrate a bit more on it with tall buildings in a moment. So what we have here is actually a um, Tamiami airport in Miami after Hurricane Andrew. Wind came in here. As you probably know, air, uh, air hangar doors are notoriously unsealed. They've just got gaps like that around them, you know. So the wind was coming in here, separating off the roof, pressurising positively inside, and the net result stripped the edge strip off the, off, the, off the roof, which is sort of what the code might predict. That's sort of like the edge strip that you've got along there. But it's internal pressures that made that sort of thing happen. So if we have open windows, then you can be adding to external negative pressures with internal positive pressures. And big issue for tall buildings. In the case of an office building, like the one that's just down the road here, 111 Eagle Street, the, the windows aren't operable, so there's a normal internal pressure that the code would stipulate it's quite small and it's pretty easy to deal with, and you still end up with some fairly high pressures up in some parts of the building, but 
it's all quite doable. Um, this is uh, what I wanted to focus on a little bit. Just one, there's one, two or three things I wanted to emphasise in the talk because I've got a, there's a lot of people in the room that are, that are on the development and construction side. Um, one is that this is a, a, some data taken from a, a sealed facade like that office building I just showed you. And then you're saying, well, what if the facade isn't sealed? So it's a residential building and you can have operable windows. And the windows are open when a storm comes through. You get all these hot spots around the place that you need to design for. See, traditionally, tall buildings up until recently were all office buildings. And now they're coming into their own as residential buildings. And, and I think a lot of people are having trouble getting around their head around the implications of that because there's actually a lot of things come into play when suddenly the purpose of the building changes and the windows are operable. And so... There's, you can end up with um, unintended consequences or things people haven't thought of. The most common one I talk to people in meetings about is partition wall between apartments. Person A has their window open, goes to work, and that same thunderstorm I showed you before comes through. Eight minutes, you've got 1,100 apartments in the building. You're not going to, be able to rush around the building and shut, close them in eight minutes. So you're going to experience that pressure, say for argument's sake, a positive pressure. Your apartment next door might have... Um, its windows open, or even not open, but if suppose they were open on the, on the other side or the adjacent side of the building, experiencing some negative pressure, the force across the partition between the apartments, provided it's not one of Richard's shear walls, but it's actually made of some um, um, plasterboard and, uh, and um, um, metal studs and so forth, can be substantial. So I'm, uh, I've come across people that, are, that plan to put 300... Um, uh, 300 pascal strength walls, which is pretty well good enough to lean against, and that's about it, right? Whereas in actual fact, the numbers might be of the order of five or six kPa, and so this, and there's ways around, the ways to fix it. Like there's a couple of projects in town that are using what are called snapshot windows, which is a development that at least on the positive pressure face, when the wind comes, to, it gets to a certain value, and you've got to tune it to the design of the building and the location. They will, it's unfortunate name snap shut. They don't snap shut, they just close and then lock. Okay? So that gets rid of half of the problem because some of the positive pressure doesn't get transmitted into the building. But you've still got to deal with probably 3 kPa uh, as a typical design value. And there are examples of that causing grief in Australia. There are projects where these partition walls have failed, and the failure could be as simple as a crack on the plasterwork, or it could be the wall actually falling over. Um, and also the other sort of quasi-definition of failure is the metal stud work, because it's being pressured back and forth all the time, starts to make this interminable noise of creaking and groaning metal scraping on itself. And there's one developer I know of that had to uh, sort of put a whole lot of home purchases of his building in separate accommodation while he went in and rebuilt these walls between the apartments. So... Just flagging things that are a bit different with tall buildings if the usage is going to be a bit different. Other, I haven't got time to talk about a lot of this, but I'm happy to after, after, afterwards with drinks. But there's mechanical issues with exhausts, particularly kitchen exhausts. A lot of people like to stick them out the side of the building. Um, and, and for about half of the wind directions, that'll be a positive environment, which means the little fan is being swamped by the pressure outside. The smell goes back into the apartment. They don't have dampers on them. The solution is to run it all up the chase and have it out the roof so it's a constant negative pressure. But people don't like doing that. It costs more money. But you know, that's when I, I lobby for that one a lot. You know, there's, there's ground floor lobbies, uh, problems with the foyers, um, lift operation can be an issue with the differential pressures. Those are all worth talking about at some point. Uh, smoke control. A lot of people, when they're testing for fires, will do it on a still day. So as long as you have a fire in a still day, you're fine. But if there's going to be a fire when it's windy, some of the smoke may in fact not get out of these nominally smoke-free stairwells. So it's something that needs to be... I think that needs a lot more thought. And I'll get off my soapbox on that one. OK, uh, last thing on pressures I want to just touch on. This is a piece of the model of the building that's going to go up next door, 443 Queen. Uh, if you, you probably have trouble seeing that because it's made of plexiglass, but basically you've got a north wing of the building and a south wing of the building, and in between is, a, in relative terms, a link that's not as dramatically stiff and large as it might be on a conventional building. This is a very unusual building going up next door. 
Craig can tell us all about it, but one thing that Arabs wanted to know is we gave them all the loads up the height of the building as you'd normally do, but then because of the way this is designed, and they needed to design the strength of this area in the centre, that is joining these north and south wings, what is the relative sharing of load between those two wings so you can design what this is all about, 47 storeys of it. So that's, that sort of thing can be done with simultaneous pressures, that's really all I'm getting at. Moving on to frame loads, this is typically done on an a, a air elastic balance or a high frequency force balance, one of those sorts of devices. Here are a couple of uh, projects. The structural engineers, like Richard and his team and the guys at Arabs, would, would give a lab, the wind tunnel lab, dynamic properties, so eigenvalue, eigenvalues, eigenvectors, mass distributions, polar moments of inertia as a function of height, thoughts on damping, that's a, that's a bit of an interesting one to talk about. Uh, so you get those sorts of uh, issues to consider. I put this in here because it puts a couple of things in perspective. Um, all this is, is a spectrum, so I need to explain that a little bit. Think of that as energy content, and this is frequency, and this is sort of a typical velocity wind spectrum. So it's saying a lot of the energy is at around these sorts of frequencies, whereas earthquake spectrums typically like that, and they're higher frequency events. Tall buildings, as the building gets taller, they get lower frequency. Shorter buildings, higher frequency, and with bridges in the middle. So um, what I'm getting at here is that as buildings become taller, they're moving into an area where there's more energy in the wind that comes into play. And an interesting corollary to that is if you're in a well-designed tall building in an earthquake, you're probably better off than in a well-designed short building because they're out of the frequency ranges of each other. Although earthquakes are not my area, but I talk to people a lot. Yes. All right, this is a video was sent to me by a pole manufacturer. If you look down here, there's a piece of paper and the wind is going approximately the length of these poles. These poles are square sections, so they look a bit like that. The wind's going in that direction and yet the poles are moving perpendicular to that direction. This is not what you want your building to do, okay? This is a small scale version of the same physics. This is vortex shedding and this is a mechanism here and that's what it looks like with smoke. But what is happening is that we're um, seeing vortices form alternately on each side and A applies a negative pressure that way and then it applies that way. On, on average, the mean load in that direction is zero, but there's very non-zero loads and a time-dependent fashion across here. So let's turn that noise off. Okay, this one's a bit quieter. This is a water flume. I think this is actually done at the University of Sydney. Um, and the water's coming in here. You've got some dye. It happens to be a circular cylinder. And so you can see those vortices are being shed off. And so whilst the bulk of the force is in that direction, the long wind load, the crosswind load on average over time is zero. But when the vortex is here, it's pulling it that way. And then it's there, it's pulling it that way. And it becomes quite non-zero. And it actually controls design, as Richard alluded to in his talk, for tall buildings. So what we have here, provided it's working, good, is a wind tunnel. Uh, we've got trips and spires. The wind's coming towards us. This is just a generic circular tower. But I would like to emphasise that uh, anything that's prismatic with height is going to attract these correlated vortices. And so if this was the penthouse area in your apartment, you really would not want to deal with that, OK? And it's simply because it's a prismatic shape. It doesn't matter whether it's a circular, a triangle, or a rectangle, or a square. It's going to do something like this. And, and if you change the shape on the way up, or you twist it or do funny things with it, you can actually uh, avoid a lot of these issues. And in this particular experiment, um, they put uh, some uh, just little lightweight tubing made a strake around it. If you're from Brisbane, you might have got driven down Milton Road and seen the brewery there, and they've got chimney stacks with these strakes on it, the same concept. And yes, it's moving from some buffeting, but it's not nearly as serious motion as the previous slide. So uh, aerodynamic features on how to improve the dynamics of buildings is actually quite important, particularly as you get tall. And uh, this uh, is a good example of it.
In fact, by way of reference, the tallest building in the world, Burj Khalifa, 828 metres or whatever it is, has no damping system in it because it was designed with aerodynamics in mind. So having to put a damper in a building, in my opinion, is sort of like saying design didn't work really well and we need to fix it. You know? If you can get the architect to design with, with um, aerodynamics in mind, you can avoid a lot of those issues. Okay, just uh, briefly, one of the things that comes out of uh, uh, wind tunnel study with a balance, just checking my time here, okay, is uh, you get this is, this is a moment about the x-axis, here's overturning moment, here's wind direction. Uh, wind coming in at 180 degrees is nominally a long wind, so this is a mean base moment, and these are the peaks either side of the mean. Um, and that's sort of what you might expect. The, uh, the peak is about twice the mean. If the wind's coming in from 90 degrees or from 270 degrees, then you have a zero mean base moment. The wind's coming in here. On average, it's not producing any moment about the x-axis, but those vortices are creating this crosswind response. The multiple peak values here in this particular plot pertain to damping ratio choices. They could equally be natural frequencies of the building. So if the structural engineer um, changes their natural frequency and the building becomes, suppose that the natural frequency goes up, they become stiffer, the loads become less. If the natural frequency um, becomes smaller, it becomes a softer building, the loads can become more. And the crosswind response can often um, exceed the, uh, the long wind case. Superimposed, try and take this same plot and then think of another one below it, just the same but shifted 90 degrees, and that's the Y moments on a building that doesn't have any surroundings, for example. And so that means that when you're getting this long wind response at the x-axis, about the y-axis you're getting one of these crosswind responses. And so you've actually got to take into account the long wind and crosswind on the two axes and degree of correlation between the two. Most labs will express that in some form a little bit like this, where this actually has the 36 wind directions and all the various ellipses. This is a Y moment, this is the X moment. And so you can look for extreme points. And as the wind lab, we don't understand the structures nearly as well as a structural engineer does. He may have a shear wall or some component in the footings or something we don't know about that... Uh, potentially can be heavily loaded compared to the rest of the structure. And so he may be interested in some point that could be maybe not this extreme one, maybe this one down here is something that's important to him. So you can actually give the data that's most relevant to the structural engineer. So we've got some tall buildings in Australia. But, uh, by Australian standards, they're quite tall. I wanted to so talk a little bit about what I call uh, super skinnies, or other people use that expression, high aspect ratio uh, buildings. This is the one that's proposed in the Gold Coast. It's, it's reasonably slender. Uh, it's, it's just it's actually in the wind tunnel as we speak. But um, it's uh, going to be uh, 103 storeys and it's in the public domain at the moment, so I thought you'd like to see that. Um, in terms of skinnier buildings, we have obviously Salil here and that's it in the wind tunnel. That's the finished product. It's approximately 12 to 1. It's, as I said, the building with a tune liquid column damper in it, which is like a giant U-tube that was described uh, earlier by Richard. Um, this is one I, a colleague in, uh, in Canada sent me this. I thought it was interesting because um, this is the one building people talk about. This is the one at uh, 432 Park Avenue. When you drive into uh, New York and from the airport and you're coming down the hill and you see the skyline before you cross the river, this thing stands out. Um, the Chinese community there call it a chopstick. Um, some of the other people I talked to call it a pencil, but the point is it's uh, an interesting building. It was tested at uh, RWDI in Canada, and uh, the interesting feature was that being a, um, be being a square shape, it's very susceptible to this vortex jetting, and the 10-year uh, peak accelerations uh, at the top of the building were of the order of 66 mg. And ideally, you'd like it to be around in the low 20s. You know, so that's pretty serious. That's carnival ride stuff. You'd sell tickets for that. Okay? So what they did was they put in these open areas. So you're sacrificing real estate, but there's five or six levels here that are just open floors with no walls or anything. In can go through. Apparently, I'm told, that dropped the 10-year peak accelerations down to a bit below 30. And then they put a damper on top of it. And it's a, a mass tune damper, which is a, a large um, pendulum style of damper. 
and uh, they sent me this so you can see it in action. Now keep in mind we're standing in the building and the building's moving. Some of that motion is the fact that the building's moving around the object, not just the object moving inside the building. Um, but it gives you a bit of an idea of the massive tonnage and also the 12 second period associated with this project. Incidentally, the apartments on the lower levels for ordinary people are $8 million each, and the ones at the top were um, $110 million each. Um, so that's how they can afford to have toys like that in the building. <laughs> Here in Australia, we've done a few of these. The actual aspect ratio of that building is 15 to 1. The aspect ratio, one that's completed in Melbourne in Flinders Street, I think it is. Yeah, Flinders Street. It's called the Phoenix. And it's actually 15. Originally, it was going to be six metres wide and 120 high. And uh, for a variety of technical reasons, I suspect, it ended up being six metres wide and 90 metres high. So it went from 20 to 1 to 15 to 1. We're currently working on some that are up near that 20 to 1 range as well. But uh, it's real, it exists, it's got a big damping tank on the top of it. And uh, this is the start of a trend because of uh, uh, reduced available space in some <laughs> cities. Okay, here's one over the road from where we are, effectively, just up the street a little bit, um, in Ann Street, uh, sort of that little vacant block of land opposite the Oriental Hotel and the, that um, mantra place. And here it is here. It's about eight or nine metres wide, uh, 15 to one aspect ratio, and uh, that's it in the wind tunnel, at least the first phase of testing anyway. Um, so we're getting a few interesting buildings appearing in our fair city. There's a more slender one than this that I can't talk specifically about it's on the Gold Coast. It could be very interesting too, because this one at least gets some protection from neighbours. The one on the Gold Coast on the beach. It's going to be interesting to see if that works or not. OK, I just wanted to touch on a couple of bits of technical stuff here. Um, this is a, a spectrum, a crosswind force spectrum. Think, again, think of this as, as sort of a non-dimensional energy at the moment. And this is a reduced frequency. It's a, a velocity divided by frequency and a, and a building width. And these lines here represent different shapes. So a square section here is actually pretty active in terms of crosswind response. Actually the Park Avenue geometry I just showed you. On the other hand, a rough, an octagonal shape, a shape is down here. This is a log plot, so yeah, more than an order of magnitude difference. So if you can play with the geometry a bit, you can do quite well. Um, one trend that's come about from that, say this is a square one, for example, it's the same thing, think of it as a spectrum at the energy content. Here's this here. Over the last uh, 20 years or so, V hasn't changed much, but buildings have become taller and thinner. So that means N goes down, natural frequency, and D goes down because they're getting narrower. And so that's getting smaller, that's getting, the whole thing's getting bigger. So since the 90s, we've been creeping up this curve. In fact, there are some projects now where they're popping over the other side, which in, in, puts all other topics on, on the table. But be aware, that's the trend with the tall, skinnier buildings. Dampers. It's a type of damper is available. This is one by Taylor Devices. They're actually very nice, top-quality products. Um, they have a history in seismic protection, but they're also used in some buildings around the world for wind issues. Um, but they're expensive, but you get what you pay for, I suppose. Um, this is what was used in the uh, World Trade Centre. There were thousands of these braces with the viscoelastic damping material um, all over the building. Um, this is one that one of the first ones. It was a tuned mass dam in the City Court building in New York. If you're familiar with New York, it's the one with a sliced top on it and it's on four centre-based columns overhanging a church, so to speak. If you walk in the foyer there and say you want to have a look at their damper up on the 50th floor or wherever it is, they'll deny it exists, they're embarrassed about it. But if you say, no, no, I know it's there, I'm a student, I've studied it, then they'll eventually take you up and you can take a photo. <laughs> Unlike some people that paint them gold and put a restaurant around them. <laughs> um, this is a tuned liquid column damper, this is what's in the uh, building, um, Merriton building that uh, Richard talked about. Ide idealistically that's what's going on, so you end up with these columns of water doing that that are acting like a pendulum. And with a pendulum, the frequency of a pendulum is only a function of length of the pendulum. The frequency of this is chiefly a function of the um, uh, high column differences. Uh, there's also one in the Seoul on the Gold Coast as well. And that was it being 
installed and before the water went in. I'm led to believe that um, when the went when the prior to that the uh, construction personnel did notice the building motion. Once it was filled with water, that largely went away. Other dampers you might come across are um, these sorts of things. Uh, the hanging chain damper, we, we design those for people quite often. This is typically spires and antennae and public art and so forth. There's actually one of those, actually three of them, in the um, building at 1 William Street um, that we put together. Okay, have a look at this. Funny thing is I've got a video clip as well, as well of a bunch of cyclists getting blown around in a different location, but much the same. I show that, people laugh at them. I show this, people go, oh, the poor ducks. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it points out that the accelerating winds coming around the corner of a building can be an issue. And here in, here in Brisbane, we've got several buildings that are quite famous for that. Um, and so pedestrian winds is a topic that you need to be aware of. If your building's amongst a whole lot of similarly sized buildings, then typically there's not much of an issue. Downwash is a mechanism that's pretty common, comes down the face of the building, uh, as suggested by that. Um, and if you're the first one on the block or you're the big one next to the river, like here, these tall buildings, you've all walked along Eagle Street and gone the gap between the buildings, it'd be quite breezy. That's part of the mechanism of what's going on. The other is horizontally accelerated flow, which is sort of like between these buildings on Eagle Street. Downwash, you want to have your entrances backed in, you want to have canopies. If you're using a, uh, um, a, a podium, although Brisbane doesn't use a lot of podiums, but some parts of the world do, then you can actually make it quite nice. Um, this is uh, just one I wanted to mention. This is, it shows a better picture of what I had in a plexiglass model for the building next door. So you can see these are the apartments, but there's an open area here and open walkways here to the apartments. And to make that work up this entire building facing southeast in Brisbane, there's actually quite a lot of glazing that goes in here, like protective walls that, that'll be in there. So it'll be open, but not immediately open. It'll be open above your head, okay? So that's uh, a lot of work went into get, get getting that right. Um, I just wanted to touch on full scale and, f and field stuff um, and, and also perhaps uh, put in a little bit of a plea and a warning. I'm seeing a lot of sunshades go up in buildings, particularly in Queensland, and that's good, but uh, they are not, in my view, being designed for dynamics. There's several of them fallen down in various places around the country, Melbourne, Sydney, I know of. There were two in the valley that fell down last year, sometime I remember. So far, nobody's been killed. They will be. As engineers, we need to be aware that it's not a static load on these things, it's a dynamic load. And so these are full-scale tests that are done on a handful of them. I'd say 1%, 2% of them in the country get some sort of full-scale testing. And when we do, we often see things like this. So this is in the Monash wind tunnel, full-scale, large area, anechoic chamber. And you can see the sunshades, and they're vibrating a little bit. And that's the dynamics that people tend to ignore. And Unfortunately, it got left. And so we see a lot of problems with it the first time they go in, the, de the detail for connecting them and so forth. So I just wanted to flag that for you as building owners, developers, um, architects, engineers, be aware that the thought has to go into that. I just want to give you another location that I've visited that's pretty impressive in South Carolina. This thing is 105 fans. You can put two-storey houses in and put cyclonic winds to about Category 4. And it's funded by the Insurance Institute there. And if you go on their website, IBHS, have a look at it. You can see the entire building just getting blown out the back of the building because they wanted to illustrate certain... It's a research facility and uh, very well funded. And they've just been doing some recent work on... Uh, solar collectors on roofs because I don't know if you're aware of it but AS 1170 and ASC 7 and the Euro code give almost no useful information on solar collectors and uh, there's a good document by SEOC if anybody's interested that's uh, Structural Engineers Association of California 
That's a very good one. That's worth looking at. Um, and I've got a paper on the history of wind tunnel testing of solar collectors, if you're interested as well, that I presented at a SEGN conference in, in, in Adelaide. But um, this is some full-scale stuff that they're doing, Tim Reinhold's doing, and uh, he showed me some videos of it, and these things, they lift slightly and then they skip across the roof, because his goal here is not to penetrate the roof. They want to put these things on big box stores that have mineral penetrations for water and so forth. And uh, so they're constrained in the test by these chains, but in reality they don't do that. But it's an, it's an interesting area and needs a lot more work. A lot of work has been done, but it's not necessarily in the public domain because companies that make these things try to keep it quiet. And I've run out of time. OK, nearly done. So um, I sometimes get asked the question about uh, computational fluid dynamics. It certainly has its place. Um, but in wind engineering, on bluff bodies, bodies with sharp corners and edges, those vortices and separation talked about before, it does not work very well. In fact, it doesn't work at all. Um, it produces uh, what cynics call col colourful flow drawings, um, but it's, it's not related to the real physics. I've got a paper here I'm happy to give to anybody that's interested that describes why it's not a terribly good technique for mechanically induced turbulence. If the flow is, motor, is, is dominated by, say, thermal effects, like a fire in an atrium, does a fine job, but with the fine scale turbulence associated with external corners on buildings, it doesn't do a very good job. It can be used as a hybrid technique though, here's an example of a, um, a building that has uh, natural ventilation. The wind tunnel can produce the uh, external pressure time series, which you can use the time varying input for the internal flows within the building. So the two techniques can merge together quite well, and that's what Russ Derricks and I talk about in this paper. <coughs> but uh, as an independent, standalone way to get a picture of pedestrian winds or cladding pressures or structural loads, it's not a good choice. And I can go on about that if anybody's interested afterwards. Uh, wind engineering, I've got a few guides, guidelines here. If you want more accurate results, buildings over 200 metres. People say, um, when would you get a wind tunnel test done? 30 years ago, it used to be when it was a tall building, and that definition has actually gone down because wind tunnel tests have become physically cheaper in real terms over time. So I don't talk about height of building anymore. I talk about value. I find that the building's worth about $25 million or more. There's a potential for savings and complexity. Uh, and the issue of resilience is the last topic. It's probably worth keeping in mind if you have... If you want the storm to be a post-disaster function or you want it to be able to be reconstituted as a different sort of structure in 100 years' time or 200 years' time, you might want to consider being more resilient in your design. Some references there, and I think that's it. Thank you very much.